The Five Lessons a Millionaire Taught Me About Life and Wealth by Richard Paul Evans Forward by Robert C. Gay I keep in my office a pair of cowboy boots that once belonged to a business colleague of mine. He had died of cancer, and his wife gave me the boots as a memorial to him. They also serve as a reminder to me of the pitfalls of wealth. This man had built a large company that he had hoped to pass on to his family, but it was not to be. Members of his family derailed that dream with their own ambitions. There was an attempt to wrest control of the company from him through unfriendly means. One of his children ended up in prison for mishandling company funds. What started out as a family dream turned into a nightmare. This was by no means the first time I had witnessed the deleterious effect of money. My father was the chief executive officer for one of the richest men in the world, Howard Hughes. From this vantage point, I saw firsthand the worst aspects of wealth, greedy power struggles, outright deceptions, and even the destruction of souls, all for the sake of money. But perhaps what influenced me most was what I saw in Mr. Hughes himself. For many years, on Christmas Eve, Mr. Hughes would call our home and ask my father to come to work. Then, when my father would arrive, Mr. Hughes would simply say, Bill, I just wanted to talk. After a couple of hours of friendly conversation, he would say, It's Christmas. You had better get back to your family. I remember thinking, with all of his money and with all of his power, he is both lonely and alone. That experience had a profound effect on me and adversely affected my feelings toward money and wealth. As a young man in my early 20s, while most of my friends were wondering how they would make their first million, I found that my thoughts were elsewhere. I decided that I wanted to be a religion teacher, a social worker, or a psychiatrist, something to help humanity, not destroy it. Truly, I wanted to be anything but a business person. When I went to my dad to discuss my future, I was stunned by his advice. I think a Harvard MBA would be great for you, he said. I angrily accused him of believing that the only thing in the world that mattered was money. Son, he replied calmly, all the love in the world and a few hundred thousand dollars is going to be is going to build the next chapel. With the advantage of twenty five years of hindsight, I can now see the wisdom of my father's guidance. Through my understanding of money, I have been blessed with the opportunity to be intimately involved in everything my heart desired. Poverty elimination, health care, education, youth rehabilitation, and helping to build my church. Through the work of our firm, thousands of jobs have been created and preserved. I have seen both sides of money, the evil and the sublime. Simply put, wealth without morality is like sex without virtue. The power to procreate is God-given and beautiful, but if misused, it can bring remarkable pain and tragedy. Likewise, money is a two-edged sword and has an equal capacity for creating happiness or misery. As potent as money is, it does not surprise me that most people tend to worship or demonize it. In both cases, they fail to do what they really should be doing, controlling money for the improvement of their own lives and for the betterment of the world. That is why I like the five lessons. In this book, Richard Paul Evans teaches not only the prudent acquisition of wealth, but also the proper mindset that should accompany that process of acquisition, namely, that money should be controlled for the sake of personal and social good. The financial principles are true and powerful, and they work on a small scale as well as a large one. While the principles taught are not new, Evans is the first to admit that they've been passed down and used by successful money managers for centuries. Never before have I seen them put together so comprehensively and succinctly and explained in such a way that nearly anyone can immediately benefit from their practice. The Five Lessons is a gift to all those who are wise enough to learn from it. I would as readily recommend this book to the young, cash-strapped, newlywed couples as to the manager of a multi-billion dollar enterprise. 
I have already instructed my staff to read this book. What better endorsement could I give than that I plan to share this book with my own children? Robert C. Gay is a special limited partner and former managing director of Bain Capital, one of the world's leading private investment firms with over $25 billion in assets under management. Preface, why I wrote this book. I'm frequently asked why a creator of inspirational novels and moral tales would write a book about money. A more appropriate question, I think, is why not? If the intent of my efforts as a writer has been to leave the world a better place, then at no time in history has the message of this book been more relevant or needed. I believe one of the great, gravest dangers plaguing modern American culture is fiscal irresponsibility. Never before have so many had so much stuff and so little freedom. Debt is forcing us to work more and more, stealing from us our precious time as well as our happiness. Money problems are breaking our marriages, our homes, and our health, and are a prime motivating factor for crime and domestic abuse. Even the destruction of our environment can be linked to our overconsumption. For millions, debt is turning the American dream into a nightmare. The five lessons contained in this book, if followed, will lead to wealth and financial independence. I know. They've worked in my life. They've worked in my family's lives. And they've worked in the lives of those counseled over the last 20 years. But more important than material wealth, these five lessons offer freedom in a world increasingly intent on creating financial slavery. The five lessons a millionaire taught me about life and wealth is more than a book. It's the first shot in a revolution aimed at taking back our lives, our homes, and our liberty. I invite you to join our movement. The gifted man who taught me these principles did so as an act of charity and generosity. I dedicate this book to him. Richard Paul Evans The Five Lessons a Millionaire Taught Me About Life and wealth. Introduction The Teacher. When the student is ready, the teacher shall appear. A Chinese proverb. When I was 12 years old, my father, a building contractor, fell through a stairwell on a construction site and shattered the bones in both of his legs. He had no disability insurance and no medical insurance, and so the financial result was nothing short of catastrophic. I come from a large family and with eight children, money was always tight. But as my father lay in bed, unable to work for nearly a year, we were in the direst of circumstances. We were forced to sell our home and move into a three-bedroom duplex. We lived off food storage and to some degree the generosity of those around us. During this difficult time, I had a life-changing experience. One of our neighbors, a very successful businessman, and a financial advisor invited the youth in our area to a lecture at the neighborhood Christian church. He wanted to teach us about money. We were confident that he knew something about the subject. We owned a professional he owned a professional basketball team, drove an expensive car and owned buildings and businesses all over the West. He was also a self made millionaire. He came from Ashton, Idaho, a tiny farm town with only two thousand residents. If, he told us, you count the dogs and chickens. He was born during the Great Depression, and like so many others at that time, his family was destitute. They rented two rooms in the back of someone else's house. They had no running water, and in the freezing northern Idaho climate, the only heat source was the small stove they cooked with. He learned to work as soon as he could walk, toiling as a common laborer picking potatoes on the area farms alongside the migrant workers. He had come a long way since then. He was the wealthiest man I knew. The first thing he did that, that day was to pull a $100 bill from his wallet and hold it up in front of us. I stared at it in wonder. I had never seen one before. He asked, Is money evil? Even though it was an evil we all wanted, sitting in the confines of a church, we all quickly agreed that it was. The Bible, said a teenage girl piously, says that money is the root of all evil. He smiled. You are referring to the New Testament scripture in First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, he replied. And it does not say that. It says that the love of money 
is the root of all evil. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. In fact, just one chapter earlier in Timothy, the Apostle Paul says that if any provide not for his own, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. How can you provide for your own without money? How about the parable of the Good Samaritan? Jesus told us to be like the Good Samaritan, yet how many of you here today could afford to pay for a stranger's hospital treatment and housing for a week? The Samaritan was able to help because he had the financial means to do so. Without it, he could only have offered minor assistance. For many, religion seems paradoxical on the subject of wealth. On the other hand, it seems to tell us that money is evil. On the other hand, God often blesses the righteous with wealth and material prosperity. For instance, in the Old Testament, after Job endured his many trials and, prov and proved his devotion to God, he was given back twice his wealth and possessions. So was God rewarding Job's righteousness with evil? Of course not. Our teacher's tone became more serious. Like most things, money can be used for good or evil. The church you are sitting in right now is built through substantial monetary contributions. Every week I see people in our area being helped through the generosity and financial ability of others. At your age, you have no idea how much money is spent on your behalf, oftentimes by people you will never meet and never thank. The day will come when you must make a decision. Will you be one who helps others or one who looks to others for help? It's your choice. You can be part of the problem or part of the solution. If you want to be the latter, then listen carefully, because what I have to tell you today will change your life. Considering my family's plight at the time, I listened very carefully. The lessons he taught that day lit a flame of hope within me. For the first time, I believed that there might be more to life than the seemingly endless financial desperation that had been my family's lot. I thought about his words constantly and began living the principles he shared. I immediately saw a difference in my own life, and that made the belief burn still brighter. By the age of 16, I had somewhat become somewhat financially independent. I bought my own clothes, my own car, and paid for my own entertainment. By 18, I had saved the equivalent of $7,000, enough to finance my schooling and a church mission. By the age of 26, I had saved enough to put 25% down on a house on a beautiful tree-lined street. By the age of 31, I had paid off my home. Less than 20 years from the time my millionaire friend gave that talk, I returned to him with several million dollars. I wanted his help in investing. He smiled when he saw me. I understand that you've done all right for yourself. I have to thank you, I said. You taught me what it takes to succeed financially. You have yourself to thank, he replied. Then his smile turned to a look of concern. I'm afraid you were the only one who listened to me that day. Maybe I was just the only one who had thought he had to. The Millionaire in the Mirror Why is it that wealth seems so distant from most people? Recently, my eight-year-old daughter asked my wife, if she'd ever seen a millionaire. My wife smiled and said that she had. Was he wearing a crown, she asked? No. Was he in a limousine? No, he was just walking. Were people dancing around him saying, Go millionaire, go millionaire? Millionaires are not as removed as you might think. There are more than three and a half million millionaires in the United States alone. In fact, if you have an average American's income, you will earn more than a million dollars in your lifetime. So you will someday be a millionaire. So will you someday be a millionaire? According to current financial trends, it's not likely. Recent statistics given by the Federal Reserve indicate that household debt is at a record high relative to domestic to disposable income. In 1946, household debt was 22% of personal disposable income. Today, it's roughly 110%. Not surprisingly, personal bankruptcies in America have more than doubled in the last decade. In fact, more Americans now declare bankruptcy each year than graduate from college. 
What about our retirement? If we take 100 Americans and follow their financial path to age 65, fewer than four will have an income above 35000 while five times that number will li live below the poverty line. More than 50% will be wholly dependent on relatives, social security, and welfare. In America, the discrepancy between the haves and have-nots has never been so wide. If Americans' individual financial prospects seem so dire, then who and where are these millionaires, these millions of millionaires? They are not all business people, doctors, lawyers, or white-collar professionals. Some are hairstylists and welders and farmers. So what's their secret? What is it that makes these people wealthy and others not? Is it luck? Fickle fate, quote-unquote, is a vicious goddess who brings no permanent good to anyone. On the contrary, she brings ruin to almost every man upon whom she showers unearned gold. She makes wanton spenders who soon dissipate all they receive and are left beset by overwhelming appetites and desires they have not the ability to gratify. George S. Clayson the richest man in Babylon. Wealth is more than just luck. Only 2% of today's millionaires inherited all or any part of their homes or property. Fewer than 20% inherited even a small portion of their wealth. And those victims of luck-induced wealth don't often retain their prizes. One study showed that of those who came into fortunes through lotteries, more than 80% were bankrupt within five years. The fate of those receiving other windfalls, such as insurance claims and inheritance, isn't much better. Is it intelligence? If wealth were more simply a matter of intelligence, a disproportionate number of millionaires would have stellar IQs and academic merit badges. This is not the case. Most of today's millionaires did not graduate with high honors. Most of them did not even qualify for a top-rated college. In light of this, it is not surprising, then, that Warren Buffett, the self-made multi-billionaire investor, was rejected by Harvard Business College. In fact, research shows that millionaires' average grade point average is lower than a B. On the other hand, high academic, well-educated people often act like complete fools when it comes to personal finances. It is common knowledge that among financial consultants that America's most educated citizens, doctors and lawyers, are notoriously bad at handling their money. What is it? If it's not luck or superior intelligence that makes the millionaire, then what is the common denominator? Besides money, of course. That the wealthy have, and the rest of humanity does not. It's simply this. The wealthy understand the principles of accumulating wealth and live them. Some wealthy people learn the principles of accumulating riches through trial and error. Some, like myself, learn from mentors or parents, and for some it just came naturally. But whatever this knowledge is source, I do not know a single self-made millionaire who does not understand and apply the five principles by mil my millionaire friend taught us that day. This is good news for everyone else, because it means that wealth is less a matter of circumstance than it is a matter of knowledge and choice. It means that we can choose to live the lives we desire. So ultimately, it comes back to you. Where do you want to go? Lesson 1. Decide to be wealthy. Would you tell me, please, Alice asked, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added, as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. Lewis Carroll, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Who wants to be a millionaire? Heather and James sat across from me in the Japanese restaurant, hopeless, irritable, and visibly upset. They couldn't figure out what had gone wrong. They had increased their income by nearly 35% in the last year, but were further in debt than ever before. They couldn't figure out how their expenses had increased so dramatically, or how their life had gotten so out of control. 
Now it looked like things were going to get worse. Their car, which they had just refinanced to cover credit card debt, was on the verge of breaking down. They had already taken a second mortgage on their home and were now looking at refinancing their home to meet their rocketing debt. Stress was at an all-time high, and they had been fighting a lot. What do you want from life? I asked. Not this, Heather replied cynically. You make a lot of money, I said. In fact, together you'll earn close to four million dollars by the time you retire. They looked at me in disbelief. Do the math, I said. Unfortunately, with your current lifestyle, you'll be bankrupt in less than two years. Heather shook her, her head, if not sooner. If you really want to change, I can help. But you need to do something first. What's that? I want you to decide to be wealthy. Wealthy, Heather said. Out of debt would be nice. It's a mindset, I said. It's all or nothing. Wealthy sounds good to me, James said. Wait a minute, Heather said. Does this mean that we have to live in poverty for the next 20 years? Because I don't think I can do that. Not at all. In fact, the beauty of this program is that you won't really miss anything. How is that possible? Trust me. I started doing this decades ago. But remember, it's all or nothing. If you can't decide, then I'd rather not waste our time. I'm in, James said. Me too, Heather said. Then let's get started. For the next hour, I shared with them the five lessons I'd learned years before from my millionaire friend. At the end of the hour, we sat over empty plates in a nearly empty restaurant. So what do you think, I asked. I feel hope again, James said. We can do this, Heather said. I know you can. Anyone can, if they'll just decide that that's what they want. I picked up the check. And don't worry, I'll pay for dinner. You can buy next time. Fifteen months later, we met again. Same restaurant, same city, different world. So tell me, how are things? Heather was all smiles. Not only have we paid off all of our debt, but we've saved more than $30,000. I also bought a new wardrobe and took an incredible trip to Italy I couldn't possibly have afforded before. It doesn't sound like you've had to cut back on your standard of living. Cut back? We've given up a few things, but all in all, it's never been so good. Especially if you consider that we don't fight over money anymore, and our kids have lost weight since we stopped eating junk food every night. This last Christmas was great. It was the first time we didn't use our credit cards, and frankly, we bought more for our kids than ever. I'm the happiest, she stopped and looked fondly at her husband. We're the happiest we've been in years. We work together, and we have more than we've ever had. James nodded in agreement. Life is so much better. I can even envision a time when I'll be able to help others financially. They looked at each other and smiled. Any regrets? I asked. Only one, Heather said. I wish that we started ten years earlier. <laughs> this time they paid for dinner. Life isn't about money. It's about God. It's about love. It's about family and relationships. It's about personal evolution, learning, and growth. Part of that growth is learning balance between the different forces of life. Money, like health spirit and spirituality, is part of that symmetry, and for those who do not accept responsibility for financial matters, life is thrown out of balance. As a dentist friend once told me, those who don't think about their teeth are those who later in life spend the most time thinking about them. It's no different with money. It's not surprising, then, that people I know who are the most obsessed with money are not the millionaires or even the billionaires. Rather, the most obsessed with money are the ones who are living paycheck to paycheck. To the financially enslaved, life becomes all about money. It's not. In order to buy, in order to be truly happy, we must live balanced lives. To be in great physical health is very much like being in great, in being, to be in great physical health is very much like being in great physical health. It allows you to do more and be more, and it permits you to live your life free of constant pain and bondage. Money is a powerful ally. With money, I've been able to provide life's necessities for my family and loved ones. 
food, comfortable shelter, as well as superior education and medical care. I've been able to retire my parents. I've provided jobs and income for others. I've helped friends in tough circumstances. I've been a able to build shelters to help abused children and support other worthy causes all around the world. It has also allowed my family and me to see the world. Wealth has brought freedom of choice and opportunity. Lack of money is the root of all evil. George Bernard Shaw On the other hand, the cost of financial distress is astronomical. The American Bar Association has indicated that nearly 90% of all divorces over the last decade can be traced to quarrels and accusations over money. Some marriage experts have estimated that 75% of all divorces result directly from clashes over finances. Debt and poverty contribute to other serious social issues as well. Studies by the Children's Welfare League of America have demonstrated a direct correlation between financial problems and domestic abuse. And there's more bad news for the fiscally challenged. Numerous studies have shown that the connection between debt have shown the connection between debt and disease. One study published in the Journal of Law, Medicine and Ethics found that nearly half the debtors reported that debt troubles had affected their health. In the end, what wealthy means is up to you. To me, when you no longer have to think about money then you are truly wealthy. The good news is that, for the most part, whether to be wealthy or not is ultimately a choice. As my millionaire friend said, you can either become part of the problem or part of the solution. That is the first lesson I learned. My life changed the day he taught me about wealth, because that was the day I decided to be wealthy. Extravagant does not equal wealthy, Question mark. The most substantial people are the most frugal and make the least show and live at the least expense. Francis Moore. Before you make the life changing decision to be wealthy, you must discard whatever media engendered notions you may have acquired concerning what it means to be rich. From a public relations standpoint, America's wealthy need an image remake. They are too often stereotyped as having gaudy, extravagant lifestyles and irresponsible fiscal habits. The media perpetuates this caricature by focusing on the small percentage of wealthy individuals who do live such ostentatious lives, lifestyles of the rich and famous wannabes. While such people do exist, they are the exception, not the rule. Two groundbreaking books have done much to shed light on the reality of America's millionaires. In The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas J. Stanley, Ph.D., and William D. Danko, Ph.D., and The Millionaire Mind by Thomas J. Stanley, Ph.D., these scholars reveal that today's millionaires are remarkably frugal and careful with their money. In fact, in many cases, even their own children do not know of their wealth. Living lives of excess, exorbitance, and waste are counter to the message of this book, and as I discuss later, such overindulgence is often short-lived. Most people you see trying to look wealthy are doing just that. An expensive car or home does not make one wealthy. In fact, the inverse is more likely true. The path I'm recommending teaches individuals how to achieve a real and enduring affluent lifestyle based on spiritual and life-centered values. The Power of Commitment As simple as this first lesson seems, it is my experience that it is the primary reason most people fail to achieve wealth. They simply never decide to be wealthy. Choice is the beginning of all journeys, and as with all first steps, it is the most important step of all. It is also the easiest. As Napoleon Hill wrote in his classic book, Think and Grow Rich, quote, Riches begin with a taste, with a state of mind, with a definiteness of purpose, with little or no hard work, end quote. There is something remarkably powerful about commitment. Commitment to a plan or thought carries with it a force that can influence the unconscious mind and bring about the desired effect. In other words, once we decide to have something, the mind unconsciously begins to create the reality necessary to bring to pass what we desire. The opposite is true as well. If we believe that we can't do something, we can't. If we think we will fail, most likely we will. 
To illustrate the unseen power of commitment, try this simple experiment. Take a piece of string and tie it to a key. Hold one end of the string with your clenched fist, dangling the key in front of you. Now look at the key and mentally tell it to rotate clockwise. Don't move your fist, just watch the key. It will begin to move in the direction you desire. Then desire the key to stop. Then tell it to change its direction and rotate counterclockwise. The key's movement seems almost mystical, but what you are really seeing is your body moving in almost imperceptible ways to grant your desire. What you have desired to happen is, in fact, happening. Ask and you will receive. I believe the power of desire is even greater. Spiritual implications. About 15 years ago, I had the desire to travel to China. I didn't have sufficient funds at the time to justify such an expensive trip, but I wrote my desire down on a list of goals for the year. Four months later, a friend called me out of the blue. She had just won an all-expense-paid trip to China for two. Her husband didn't really want to go, so she asked if my wife and I would like to take the trip instead. Of course, you could call that a coincidence, but the odds of something like that happening would suggest otherwise. To choose the path is to choose the destination. After one of my seminars, a man approached me. Your presentation was insightful, but you're wrong on one point, he said. I've never decided to be a millionaire, but I am. How did you become a millionaire, I asked. He thought about it. Well, pretty much by living the other four lessons you taught tonight. Let me ask you this. If you decide to live a healthy lifestyle, are you in fact deciding to be healthy? Probably yes. Exactly. You decided to be wealthy when you decided to live the principles of accumulating wealth. He smiled. I guess I did decide. One small step. It's within your power right now to take the first step to wealth. Decide to be wealthy. Declare your intention by saying it out loud, then writing on a card. Today I decide to be wealthy. Put the card in a nightstand or next to your toothbrush. Look at it and read those words every morning, when you get up and every evening when you go to bed. Keep a copy of it in your wallet next to your credit card. Do this for the next two months. Then congratulate yourself. You've just made a life a life-changing decision. Lesson one, decide to be wealthy. Lesson two, take responsibility for your money. Money makes a good servant, but a bad master, French proverb. When it comes to money, far too many of us are asleep at the wheel. Many Americans view money as an uncontrollable, almost mystical entity. It's not. In its most basic form, it's just metal and paper. And if you don't control your money, it will control you. Taking control of your money begins with taking responsibility for it. That means knowing how much you have, where it is coming from, and where it is going, and what it's doing in the meantime. Taking responsibility for your money means not completely turning it over to a bookkeeper or a spouse. It's a matter of personal stewardship. It's like parenting. You cannot leave control of your children to someone else and just hope that they will turn out all right. It's not just the poor or uneducated who fall prey to fiscal irresponsibility. An acquaintance of mine, with more than $10 million to his name, woke one day to find himself nearly broke. The group of investors he had hired to manage his money had tied it up in risky investments that had not only wiped out his capital but left major debts in excess of what he owned. owned. He had been too busy in other ventures to watch where his money was going. Another acquaintance, finding his bank account depleted after burning through tens of thousands of dollars, said to me, We have nothing to show for it. All I can figure out is that we spend all our money on Happy Meals. Unfortunately, most people's closets are more organized than their finances. If you're one of the fiscally irresponsible, it's time to change. A new beginning. No matter how irresponsible you've been in the past or still are, it's never too late to take control. There are the four steps to taking responsibility for your money. 1. Know how much money you have. How much are you really worth? The net worth, 
form in the back of this book will help you calculate your current monetary value and will give you a starting point for your wealth accumulation. Think of it as stepping on a scale at the start of a diet. At the end of each month, fill out the report again to chart your prog progress. Then at the end of each year, fill out an annual report. This will give you the most accurate view of your accumulating wealth. As your wealth grows, you'll find yourself looking forward to completing the forms. 2. Know where your money comes from. Every paycheck, bonus, interest payment, alimony check, child support payment, royalty, dividend, gift, and tip you receive should be recorded on a ledger as income. This information will help you in two ways. First, it will clarify how your time is best used to increase your income. For instance, a while back I decided to try breaking into the music production business. I started with one artist, a talented, locally popular musician. His CD was successful and even hit the national billboard charge. But when we completed reviewing our annual income, we learned that what took 30 to 40 percent of my time actually brought in less than 1 percent of my income. I quickly got out of the business and focused my attention on other areas that were more profitable. Second, knowing where your money comes from will help you decide how your money should be used. Ongoing income, such as your monthly salary and alimony, or childhood support payments, should cover ongoing expenditures. One-time money, such as a bonus or inheritance, should be used to pay for one-time expenditures, such as vacation or an education fund, or for paying down your mortgage. 3. Know where your money is going. While it is useful and important to know what you are worth and where your money comes from, understanding exactly where you are spending your money is the only way to gain control of it. You can't plug the holes in your boat if you don't know where they are. As my own financial empire grew, I became careless and relinquished more and more control to others. I soon found myself short on, running short on cash. When I regained control of my finances, I discovered that my overhead had nearly doubled in my absence. For tracking your spending, I recommend the use of a checkbook and a simple computer program such as Quicken. But technology is not necessary. For the first 20 years of my financial life, I kept track of my money in an inexpensive ledger I purchased at an office supply store. In the resources section at the end of this book is a cash flow form. This form will help you categorize all your income and expenses. You will notice that the first line under expenditures is for documenting how much you are paying yourself. In the next lesson, you will learn to always keep a portion of what you earn. The second expenditure on the form is for charitable donations. Lesson 5 addresses this important budget item. The rest of your expense categories will depend on your lifestyle. Each expenditure on your cash flow form has the opportunity for reduction to help you maximize your income. I've compiled a tip sheet on ways to comfortably cut down on expenses in each spending category. See Winning in the Margins with Savings in the Resources section of this book. More than you think. As you track your money, you will quickly discover that most things cost more than you think. For instance, a friend of mine wanted to buy a new car. It was an inexpensive car, more than 30000 and would require her... It was an expensive car, more than $30,000, and would require her to sacrifice to afford it. It didn't sound like a good idea to me, and I told her. But we can make the payments, she countered. Wouldn't you be just as happy with a car in the $20,000 range, I asked. She thought about it. But I want that car, and we can't afford it. Are you sure? Have you considered all the costs? It's just two forty. dollars more a month than my last car. How much are the extra taxes? I hadn't thought about that. How about the extra insurance? I don't know. I hadn't thought about that either. She looked up the additional expenses and found that they came to almost $1,000 a year. So you're paying almost an additional $4,000 a year for this car and another 10% for lost interest on that money. And since this SUV is not as fuel efficient as your current car, and another five hundred, add another five hundred dollars a year, you're now up to almost five thousand dollars. With state and federal taxes, how much extra do you need to earn to bring home that much? 
I don't know, about 7000 So you just took a $7,000 play pay decrease in order to drive a more expensive new car that you probably won't care that much about six months from now. After realizing the actual cost involved, she decided against the purchase. Learning where your money is going is the most important step to gaining control of your finances. It is almost an important way to gain it is almost as important way to gain control of your life. A woman I know, frustrated that her money was always running short each month, finally took all her financial records to a CPA to see if he could make sense of them. He found large discrepancies in the records and it was only then that she discovered that her husband had a drug problem. 4. Know what your money is doing. The entire point of amassing wealth is to make it work for you. Eventually, as you stay true to yourself and the five lessons, your money will earn more each year than your salary. Money will become your servant instead of the other way around. If you had an employee who sat around and did nothing, you would quickly fire him. Ongoing monthly evaluation of your investments is vital to your financial success. As you fill out your monthly net worth form, you will see clearly just how hard your money is working for you, exactly where you should put your money to make it work for you, is a much more complex matter and is addressed more fully in the next lesson. I don't have time for this, quote unquote. Saying that you don't have time to follow your money is like saying that you don't have time to watch the traffic signals as you drive. In fact, you don't have time not to. You spend thousands of hours each year earning. Why wouldn't you take a few hours a month to track where it goes? There are none so blind as those who will not see. The saying goes, it's time to open your eyes. Ultimately, it is the only rational way to live. Lesson 3. Keep a portion of everything you earn. You can't touch this, MC Hammer. News stories about celebrities declaring bankruptcy or crying to the media about their financial woes never cease to amaze me. From rock stars pawning their Grammys in order to pay delinquent tax bills to former professional boxers waiting on tables, the list of financial casualties grows annually. The questions I find myself asking are, why didn't they just put some of what they had someplace safe? Why didn't they save the proceeds from just one album, or in the case of the boxer, just one title fight? If they had, they'd still be wealthy. It's not just the celebrities. Of course, celebrities aren't the only ones making bad financial choices. A financial advisor told me the tragic story of a client who had been seriously injured at work losing a limb in an on-the-job accident. In compensation, he had received a $3 million insurance settlement, enough, if properly handled, to enable him to support his family indefinitely at a level significantly higher than what they were used to. Almost immediately after my friend created a financial plan for this couple, their resolve to responsibly manage their wealth weakened. Seduced by their sudden riches, they began taking a little here and there, buying things, recklessly loaning money to family and friends, launching unwise business ventures. The list of expenses grew as their account diminished. On a subsequent meeting with this couple, my friend noticed that the woman was wearing the largest diamond he had ever seen. She deserves it, her husband said. After all, she's been through it by accident. In spite of my friend's ongoing counsel and encouragement, Week after week, the couple withdrew funds until less than three years later, they were completely broke and were both out looking for work. The reason they and others in similar situations fail is twofold. First, because of the dangerous, of a dangerous mindset. The erroneous belief that they can always make more. Then they suffer the first downturn in sales or their first knockdown and their financial house of cards collapses. Second, and more importantly, it's because they do not understand the principles of wealth, especially the third lesson. A portion of all you earn is yours to keep. But all I earn is mine to keep, you might reply. 
If that's true, then why do you have so little of it left? The truth is that you give your money to everyone but yourself. You've heard it said before, and it's true. It's not what you earn, it's what you keep that makes you rich. The wealthy person pays herself first. Pay yourself first is a popular modern, modern financial catchphrase, but it has actually been around for decades. Back in the 20s, George S. Clayson wrote, I found the road to wealth when I decided that a part of all I earned was mine to keep. How much should you pay yourself? That depends a good deal. <clears throat> As the Cheshire Cat said to Alice, on where you want to get to and how fast you want to get there. Obviously, the more you put away, the faster you'll achieve your goal. I recommend that you push yourself as hard as possible at first, just to test your limits. Then, when you ease back, you will find your comfort zone. However, the amount you save should be a minimum of 10% of your ongoing salary and 90 to 100% of your side earnings. Research shows that most American millionaires save between 15 and 20% of their incomes. The power of compound interest. You may have heard the joke about Einstein dying and going to heaven. While they were putting the final touches on his heavenly mansion, he was temporarily placed in an apartment with three roommates. His first roommate had an IQ of 180. Great, Einstein exclaimed. We can talk about the theory of relativ relativity. The second roommate had an IQ of 140. Good, Einstein said. We can talk about Mensa. The third roommate had an IQ of 75. Okay, he said. We'll talk about interest rates. As simple as interest rate, as interest is to understand, the majority of Americans do not realize the power of compounding interest until it is too late to take full advantage of it. The following tables illustrate the power of compound interest. According to the 2000 census, the average American household income is $46,805 a year. If Mr. and Ms. Mrs. Average allocate 10 or 15 or 20 percent of their income to their nest egg and earn an average interest rate of 10.2 percent based on the average S&P 500 over the last 50 years, they will accumulate wealth at the following rates. And there's a chart here to look at. And it gets even better. Lesson 4 describes a method that allows you to do more than double these amounts. I can't save that much. Initially, putting 10% of your income into your nest egg might require some faith, but it's worth the leap. Prove it for yourself. I've heard it over and over again from those who've tried. We never miss the money we put away. This program isn't about deprivation. I found that most people I interview are losing between 10 and 20 percent of their income. That is, that much of their income disappears without a trace. This being the case, I tell them the good news about their dilemma. They can easily save in and invest that much of their income and not notice any change in their current lifestyle. In fact, as was earlier illustrated by Heather and James' situation, most of those I've helped have actually experienced an improvement in their standard of living. As they adhere to the five lessons, they find themselves managing and remaining managing the remaining percentage of their income much better than before. Starting your nest egg. Becoming wealthy is as much a psychological and emotional exercise as a physical one. Anyone who has ever <coughs> dieted knows that it's easier to stick to a diet when you see immediate progress in the mirror and on the scale. Likewise, the most powerful way to encourage new wealth accumulating behavior is to see visible, tangible results. I found that the best way to see tangible results is to create tangible wealth, to have something you can watch grow. In physical terms, this is called a nest egg, a sum of money put aside for future expenses. Personally, I prefer the dictionary's older, original definition of a nest egg. A real or artificial egg that is put in a hen's nest to encourage it to continue laying after the other eggs have been removed. This definition alludes to a powerful psychological need for anyone attempting to accumulate wealth. 
the provision of incentives in order to spur further productivity. I cannot overstate the importance of creating an abiding mental concept of your nest egg. When I was 14 years old, I decided to start building my wealth by collecting precious metals. I couldn't afford gold coins, but silver was selling for around $3 an ounce, about two hours of work at my part-time job. I took one of my mom's canning jars and began filling it with one-ounce silver rounds. This method of wealth accumulation had several advantages. First, the fact that the rounds were not actual currency lessened the temptation to spend them. If I wanted to, I would first have to cash them in at a coin shop and take a loss in doing so. Second, I could actually see myself growing richer. As a poor boy, I found it satisfying to watch my wealth increase, and as nothing fuels success like success, the desire to watch the pile of silver grow helped motivate me to save more. The coins multiplied quickly, and soon I had filled several jars. Then I filled an entire wooden chest with silver. I felt like a pirate with a treasure chest. By the time I was 18, I had saved thousands of dollars. James and Heather chose to follow the precious metals route as well. Heather pointed out to me two advantages she had discovered in accumulating metals. First, it gave her perspective. She began to weigh the cost of an item against the price of silver. For example, she said I could take my kids out for dinner, or I could buy four more pieces of silver. Second, Purchasing the silver round satisfied Heather's urge to spend. Like so many others, she had discovered that she was a shopaholic. So spending her money on silver was like eating her cake and having it too. Purchasing Precious Metals As with all investments, there are pros and cons to purchasing precious metals. Starting your nest egg with precious metals is good for emotional and security reasons, but in the long run, it is not likely to pay off the interest you need for steady financial growth. In the last 50 years, the average annual return on precious metals has been around 4.5%, less than half the rate of return of the S&P 500. For this reason, I recommend starting your nest egg with metals. Then, after the first year, enlist the help of a professional financial advisor and turn to other forms of investments. If you're on a limited income, I recommend purchasing silver. I began with 0.999 pure one-ounce silver rounds as opposed to coins or bullion. You'll pay a bit more for rounds, but they offer a better guarantee of authenticity, and you'll recover the extra money paid when you sell. Be careful not to buy unless it's your intention. Special collector's coins, as they likewise carry a special price, which may not be recoverable when it comes time to sell. The same is true if you're purchasing gold. For gold, 0.999 pure one-ounce coins, as well as other weights, are minted in the form of Canadian maple leaves. American Eagles and South African Cougarans. Both silver and gold are available at top at coin shops and precious metal dealers. Be sure to shop around before you purchase as dealers update their prices at different times of the day. Seek professional assistance. Ultimately, how and where you keep your nest egg is a decision you should base on your own current financial needs and the availability of trustworthy financial counsel. As your investment builds, take the time to learn more about investing and investment opportunities. Diversity is important. As your nest egg grows, you may want to have a combination of securities, precious metals, and real estate. A 401k can be a very powerful tool in building wealth. Above all, avoid risky schemes and investments, no matter the supposed payoff, just as you would consult a doctor before making any serious decisions regarding your health. Consult an established, successful investment counselor before you make any major investment decision. Don't kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. As you watch your nest egg grow, you will begin to feel the power that comes from wealth. You will notice things that are within your financial grasp and were not available to you before. With this newfound power, you will be tempted to dip into the nest and steal a few eggs. Resist. Most of us are familiar with the fable, the goose that laid the golden eggs. In this story, a poor country man discovers that one of his geese lays golden eggs, but only one a day. At first, he is happy with his newfound riches, but as his wealth grows, he, became, he becomes greedy and impatient. Finally, he decides 
to cut the goose open to get all the gold at once. Of course, in so doing, he only manages to kill the goose and gets no more eggs. This is exactly how you must view your nest egg. In time, it will earn more income than you can than you can by working full time, but only if you leave it alone long enough to allow it to grow. Should I first pay off my debt? What to do with current debt is a question that most face as they gain control of their money. Should you first pay off your debt? The unequivocal answer is, it depends. The first thing I recommend is that you consolidate your debt with the lowest interest rate possible. If you are struggling with significant debt, you might want to consult with a CCCS, a Consumer Credit Counseling Service. This is the time to perform what author and radio personality Dave Ramsey calls plastic surgery. Cut up your credit cards. One of the worst things that can happen after if you have consolidated your debt is for you to create a new form of debt. With the debt repayment plan in place, consider the amount of interest you're paying and decide if eliminating your debt first is the right thing to do. In most cases, I recommend using 10% of your funds for debt repayment and 10% for your wealth accumulation, even if you are losing a few percentage points in interest. The reason for this is psychological. It is important emotionally for you to see the growth of your wealth. If you're not seeing your wealth increase, you will be less motivated and ultimately less likely to succeed. There is another advantage to simultaneously saving and paying off your debt. It will help train your new lifestyle. Once your debt is paid off, apply the extra 10% to your nest egg to accelerate your wealth accumulation. Lesson 4. Win in the margins. Fortune befriends the bold. Virgil, the Anad, translated by John Dryden. Of all the lessons, lesson four has the most to do with the speed of my own financial success. What does it mean to win in the margins? Simply this. The wealthy find additional ways to increase contributions to their growing nest egg. J. Paul Getty, once named the richest man of the world by Fortune magazine, called this the millionaire mentality. Quote, the millionaire mentality watches costs and tries to reduce them and strives to increase production and sales and thus profits, end quote. Though Getty was speaking specifically about business, the principles are true in all areas of finance. These are essentially, there are essentially two ways to win in the margins. The first is by earning extra income. The second is by keeping more of what you earn. I recommend that you do both. Winning in the margins with extra income. I once had a friend who had the peculiar habit of looking for money. He would actually walk or ride his bike while looking down. As odd as his behavior was, the most surprising result of his habit was that nearly every day he would find something. He would be walking along when suddenly he'd stop, bend over, and lift a coin or bill from the ground. I'm not recommending that you start walking looking down. My point in sharing this story is to demonstrate that you find what you are looking for. When you start looking for ways to increase your income, you will discover that there are opportunities all around you that you have never thought of or noticed. The following examples illustrate this principle. Coffee cans of gold. My wife's grandfather, Pietro de Sera, immigrated from Italy to America when he was only 17. He came west looking for work and found employment in the gold and silver mines of the Tintic mining area, west of the Salt Lake Valley. He worked a night shift at the furnaces where the processed ore was smelted in in order to separate the gold from the other metals before being poured into bullion. Pietro noticed that the gold would occasionally explode, splashing the metal inside on the hood of the small furnace. He asked his foreman if he could keep the metal he found if he stayed after his shift and cleaned the hood in his own mine, in his own time. The foreman agreed. At the end of each shift, Pietro would climb into the furnace and scrape the thin gold flakes from the metal hood into an empty coffee can. Within months, the poor immigrant boy had collected two coffee cans filled to the brim with the precious metal, nearly 20 pounds of gold. Scrap wood. 
Clinton Phelps grew up in the wooded mountains of southern Oregon. To provide for his family, he drove a truck, hauling lumber from a nearby lumber mill. While waiting for his truck to be loaded, he often heard the mill workers complain, complain about the mill's waste products. After the usable wood was cut into boards, the remaining slabs were thrown on a conveyor belt and transported to an incinerator to be burned. Much of the wood was too green to burn well, and the mill workers had trouble keeping up with the waste. In addition, the smoke from the incinerator had the townspeople and environmentalists constantly up in arms. One day, Clinton had an idea. He asked the mill owners if they would allow him to take the wood, offering to cut it up and haul it away at no charge to them. Glad to be free of the problem, they accepted his offer, even agreeing to pay for the electricity he needed to cut the wood. Before long, he was hauling out nearly 100 cords of firewood every day, which he sold in a nearby town. He may have been just a truck driver with an 8th grade education, but with a simple idea, he had increased his salary by more than $100,000 a year. And the land he bought years ago to store the wood is now worth millions. Renting farmland. Warren Buffett, the sagacious multimillionaire, learned the lesson of winning in the margins early in life. At the age of just 14, he bought 40 acres of Nebraska farmland with money he made on his paper route and then rented the land. He also invested in soda pop and pinball machines and used his profits to make his first investments partnership. The rest, as they say, is history. Home business. As a young man, Lance Schiffman met a Chinese billionaire. In the man's home were original Picassos, Ming vases, and priceless tapestries. Making the most of the opportunity, Lance asked the billionaire how to get rich. The man's advice was simple. Work the day job, he said. Get insurance and benefits and stability for your family. You owe them that. But always be looking for the side way to earn. That's where you'll find wealth. In other words, win in the margins. Lance followed his advice while he was working nights and graveyard shifts for an airline. Winging luggage, as he called it, he tried as many side projects as he could. He owned a triplex, a fast food restaurant, a gas station, and a florist shop. Some of his ventures were profitable, others not. One day, a friend introduced him to a network marketing company. He signed up and began telling others about the company. They, in turn, told and signed up others. Within two years, Lance had more than 30,000 distributors and was earning well over half a million dollars a year. More than 12 million Americans are currently involved in network marketing companies. The good news is network marketing can offer low financial risk with a huge potential upside. The bad news is most people do not exceed in making money. I do not believe network marketing is for everyone. For more information about how to select a legitimate network marketing company, go to page 90. A Christmas gift. The most money I've made in my lifetime was on a side project. It wasn't my first such venture. It was my 14th. For me, the habit of winning in the margin started when I was young. At the age of 20, I was working for low wages cleaning up construction sites. Such menial labor, labor gave me ample time to think, though admittedly most of what I thought about was how I could find another job and quit cleaning construction sites. As I thought over my situation, I realized that there were no vending machines on the job site, and that every few hours the construction workers would send someone to a nearby convenience store for soda pop. I saw an opportunity. That night on the way home from work, I bought an expensive cooler at a second-hand store, then purchased soda pop and candy bars and gross from a nearby price club. The next day I took my cooler to work selling my products at a dollar each. I doubled my income, making as much on the treats as I did pushing a broom. I eventually accomplished my goal and moved on to another job, but I never stopped trying to win in the margins. My big hit came ten years later when I decided to self-publish a book I had written as a Christmas present for my daughters. I hadn't intended to publish the book, but after receiving many requests for copies, I decided to print a few. The first year, that little book netted me $20,000. I reinvested my earnings, and the second year, I earned more than four hundred thousand dollars 
the third year, I earned nearly $4.5 million. That's when I quit my day job. You could say that I and the others I've written about here were just lucky. Of course we were. But as George S. Clayson wrote, Opportunity is a haughty goddess who wastes not her time with the unprepared. Was it luck that caused me and my colleagues to try again and again to find ways to succeed financially? Was it luck that I noticed a trend with my book? Was it luck that I consulted all the experts I could find about making my book a success? Was it luck that I took copious notes on each marketing venture I tried evaluating its success and failures? The bottom line is, and you should underline this, I would never have been lucky had I not been looking for ways to increase my earning ability. Double your wealth. While those in the previous examples all hit it big, even earning just a percentage of what your regular income each month goes a long way toward building your wealth. As indicated by the tables showing compound interest in Lesson 3, if you are earning an average household income and are saving 10%, you are putting away about $468 a month. If you increase your income by an extra $468 a month and apply it to your nest egg, it is in the long-term accumulation of wealth, the equivalent, equivalent of doubling your income. By increasing your nest egg contribution through earning or saving an additional 10% each month, the average household will achieve millionaire status more than 7 years earlier. Clearly the path of extra income is worth pursuing, but where do you find the extra income? As demonstrated by my friend who walked with his head down looking for money, it's all around you. In the resources section of this book under Winning in the Margins with Extra Income is a list of possible additional sources of income. However, winning in the margins will come through paying attention to the unique opportunities that already surround you. I suggest, I suggested earlier that there's another way to double your contribution to your nest egg that doesn't include extra earnings. Saving is the second way to win in the margins. Winning in the margins with savings. Money has wings, Proverbs 23, verse 5. Successful wealth builders understand that the world is designed to take their money. When I was nine years old, my older sister read a book on hypnosis. Then she hypnotized my brother. She told him that he was standing in the middle of the desert beneath the hot, scorching sun and that his feet were glued to the floor. Try as he might, my brother couldn't lift his feet, and even though it was the middle of winter, his skin began to turn red and his forehead beaded with sweat until it dripped down his face. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. A few years later, as a teenager, I remembered what my sister had done, and I began studying how hypnosis worked. Then I began experimenting. I hypnotized many of my friends, even though those who didn't believe they could be hypnotized. I was amazed that people with their eyes wide open would see things that weren't there, hear voices, even talk to people who didn't exist. One of my friends, realizing the power of hypnosis, asked if I could create for her an imaginary date with Johnny Depp. I believe that to some degree we are all hypnotized to believe things that aren't true. Essentially hypnosis is a simple act of suggesting something to the mind. If the hypnotized individual decides to accept the suggestion, then the brain works to make it seem true. Once we have accepted a suggestion, the world around us begins to change to conform to our belief. In other words, our beliefs shape our reality more than our reality shapes our beliefs. Billions of dollars have been spent to suggest to your mind what will make you happy, what you should look like, what you should drive, eat, and wear, and ultimately how you should spend your money. The collective power of those suggestions is likely far more efficacious than you realize. Just look at a 30-year-old fashion magazine. What were we thinking? Or was someone thinking for us? Early in my advertising career, I wrote a radio commercial for a local chain of copy centers. In this commercial, I depicted a man talking about the copy center's new, longer hours with a customer who'd shown up 
at his store at five minutes past five o'clock, needing ex exactly 3,000 copies by morning. The radio spots ran, and to our surprise, the managers at each of the seven copy centers reported that they had had a rush of people showing up at 5.05, needing exactly 3,000 copies by morning. In the same way that the millionaire mentality, quote-unquote, recognizes that the world is designed to take our money, it also knows that the average American has been brainwashed to consume and spend. Billions of dollars are spent in advertising each year to entice you to spend. Market researchers and retail anthropologists specifically study your shopping behavior to more efficiently target you. On the internet, computers tracking your spending habits and systematically parade officers offers in front of you. Politicians and bureaucrats increase fees and taxes. Determined salespeople take courses in learning how to get you to pay with your money. And it's getting worse. Marketers are targeting younger and younger consumers, addicting them to a lifestyle of overconsumption. From 1980 to today, advertising to children in America has increased more than tenfold, from $100 million a year or more a year to more than $1 billion. Successful wealth builders recognize the nature of the real world and therefore carefully scrutinize each expenditure. They learn to win in the margins by keeping more of what they earn. While most of today's self-help books spout messages about thinking big, in J. Paul Getty's 1965 book, How to Be Rich, Getty argued that the problem of financial failure is often attributable to the inability to think small. The millionaire mentality, he wrote, quote, gives meticulous attention to even the smallest details and misses no opportunities to reduce costs in his own or his employer's business, end quote. This millionaire mentality, quote unquote, can be applied to all aspects of financial endeavor, from business to personal spending. There are four key mindsets that characterize the wealth builder. One, the millionaire mentality carefully considers each expenditure. Two, the millionaire mentality believes that freedom and power are better than momentary pleasure. Three, the millionaire mentality does not equate spending with happiness. And four, the millionaire mentality protects the nest egg. Mindset 1. The millionaire mentality carefully considers each expenditure. There are three questions that the successful wealth builder asks himself before he spends his money. 1. Is this expenditure really necessary, or is it possible to get the same personal effect without using money or using less of it? One of the best-dressed women I know is a single mother living on a very limited income. How can you afford such a beautiful wardrobe, I ask her. She smiled and said it was her secret. Later on, she offered to tell me, I only buy used clothing, high quality, but pre-owned by some rich person. I let them lose the value. Same effect without the financial effect. A few years ago, I was in Venice, standing near the gondolas by the Piazza San Marco waiting for the rest of my group to arrive. I had lived in Italy for more than a year and spoke enough Italian to be conversant. The gondoliers, however, assumed that I was just another American tourist, so they didn't worry about what they said in front of me. How much do I charge this group? One of the gondoliers asked. Fifty dollars for Japanese, forty dollars for Americans, twenty dollars for Italians. How do you determine what to charge? I asked the man in Italian. Embarrassed that I had understood him, he finally answered, Whatever they will pay. Most prices are determined in this very way, and as such are unusually far more negotiable than you think. This doesn't mean you have to become a hardened haggler. Simple, soft-voiced inquiry is often just as effective, if not more so. Recently, I was shopping for some computer equipment at a local electronics dealer. After the salesperson had demonstrated the equipment and quoted a price, I simply asked him if they matched the lowest price available. I hate buying something that the next day, and the next day finding it cheaper somewhere else, I explained. He thought about it and said, just a minute. He pulled up a comparison site 
on the internet and we immediately found the same equipment available for $140 less. There's the price, I said. He not only sold it to me for that price, but threw in a few other complimentary items as well. Seven Golden Words A salesman friend of mine was trying to negotiate a deal with a large client, but when he quoted his client his bid, the man's forehead creased with concern. Is that the best you can do, he asked. My friend began to squirm. He left the room and called his boss. We've got to do better, he said. His boss gave him a better price. Newly confident with his bid, my friend sat back down with his client. We can go 3% less. The man still looked concerned. Is that really the best you can do? My friend, more certain that he was about to lose the account, went back to the phone. He again talked to his boss, who conceded one more percent discount. After that, it wasn't going to be enough. My friend threw in a portion of his own sales commission. Still, the client didn't seem impressed. Is that truly the best you can do? My friend said, aside. I'm sorry, he said, but it is. The man smiled. Fine, I'll sign the order. I was just making sure that it really was your best offer. Only then did my friend realize that the man would have paid the first price quoted. Just seven simple words. Is that the best you can do? Of all the advice in this book, the seven golden words are likely to provide you the most immediate and surprising success. A friend of mine who was in the middle of building a home claimed to have saved more than $25,000 by using the seven golden words. Another reader reported saving more than $1,000 within two hours of learning the seven golden rule words. We hear these success stories regularly, not that this surprises me. I have a rather large and growing collection of my own. The seven golden words work. Winning in the margins means pushing the limit to see just how low you can purchase, especially on the big, the big ticket items. A financial consultant once said to me, it drives me crazy the way people compartmentalize their money. They'll clip coupons to save 35 cents on a can of soup then throw thousands away on a big purchase because they didn't bother to compare prices or even ask if they could get it for less. I once saved a third of the price of a car just by checking the internet and comparing prices. I found a rare car I liked at a dealership. After inquiring about the price, I immediately went home and searched the internet. I found the identical car for m much less in a different state. I went back to the dealership and made an offer for 30% less than the quoted price. At first, the salesman laughed. Then I showed him a print out of the car in California and told him I could fly my whole family to Disneyland for a week, then drive the car back myself and still save more than $10,000. I asked him what he would do. He called back the next day to accept my offer. Less is more, as long as we're asking the question, is this expenditure really necessary? Something should be written about consumption. Americans currently overconsume at record and embarrassing levels. The quest to have more can be seen in our homes as well as our waistline. In 1950, the average home was 1,100 square feet. In 1970, it had increased to 1,400 square feet. By the year 2000, the average home was more than 2,000 square feet, despite the fact that families had gotten smaller. As a nation, we are spending more and more and enjoying it less. Peculiarly, more people surveyed in the 50s describe themselves as rich than do today. Curtailing the pattern of overconsumption is an important step not just in saving but in freeing ourselves from our possessions. Psychologically, in spite of all we've been told or sold, more is less and less is more. This is corroborated by a study that showed that 86% of Americans felt happier having voluntarily cut back on consumption. 2. Is this expenditure contributing to my wealth or taking from it? Of course, not all expenditures can be assets, but continually asking this question helps wealth builders redirect the use of their money. It's no coincidence that the wealthy put their money in their homes instead of their cars. Homes usually appreciate. Cars almost always depreciate. 3. Is this an impulse purchase or a planned purchase? 
Am I being pressured to make an expenditure I'm not certain about? Candy bars and magazines line the checkout stands like thugs waiting to jump you as you pull out your wallet or purse. Late night infomercials come at you when you're tired and your resistance is down. The impulse buy is the mainstay of the American retail establishment. The layout of the grocery store testifies to this, which is why the essentials, meat, eggs, and milk, are always at the back of the store, making you pass aisle after aisle of possible impulse purchases. As it works, most grocery stores estimate that more than 50% of purchases are impulse purchases. You've heard the adage, never shop with an empty stomach. This wisdom should be applied whenever money is concerned. But what you mean to buy, buy what you mean to buy, whether it's for groceries or a new car. Save time and money by shopping with a list. Going once, going twice. Early in our marriage, we made a commitment to never make any large purchase on impulse, quote-unquote. If the salesperson said he needed an answer right now, then the answer was no. In 20 years, we haven't once regretted walking away from a strong-arm sales pitch. Not once. In fact, whenever we found ourselves being pressured by an aggressive salesperson, one who was insisting that we had to buy now or let a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity pass, it was very empowering to be able to say no. The funny thing is that despite all the threats that the opportunity would pass, it never did. Not once that I can remember. But many times we passed. Often after a good night's sleep, we decided we really could live without an automatic sock stacker after all. Unfortunately, on one occasion, I broke the rule. Against my wife's counsel, I bought under pressure. I fell in love with a piece of property. It was heaven on earth, I thought, and I was afraid that if I delayed, I would lose it. I enjoyed my decision for three months rationalized it for another six months, and regretted it for six long, painful years. That's how long it took me to get out from under the debt after losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Again, this program is not about deprivation. It's about not wasting money. But whatever, buy whatever you want, if you have the money. Just make sure that you really want it and will enjoy it for at least as long as you have to pay for it. Realize your savings. Whenever you save money from using one of these techniques, it is important that you realize those savings by moving the money saved into your nest egg. For instance, a friend of mine was about to pay off a hospital bill and had already written out the check when he decided to try the seven golden words. The hospital apologetically told him that it could only discount the bill by 10%. He was delighted, of course. He tore up the check he had written and wrote two more one for the revised hospital bill and the second to his nest egg for the 10% he had just saved. Remember, if you are able to save just $100 a month and you faithfully transfer it to your nest egg in 40 years, compounded at the average S&P 500 rate of 10.2%, that little extra saving will be worth close to $700,000. Mindset 2. The millionaire mentality believes that freedom and power are better than momentary pleasure. Too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things they don't want to impress people they don't like. Will Smith The sirens of credit are luring Americans to the rocks of disaster. Their enticing song, Buy Now, Pay Later, is indeed truth in advertising, though it was certainly not intended to be. Pay is exactly what America is doing. The price we pay to have it now is quite clear. Broken marriages, homes, health, and lives. The successful wealth builder understands the danger of debt and knows that the primary way to avoid it is by delaying gratification. A decade ago, Time Magazine reported that brain research suggests that emotions, not IQ, may be the true measure of human intelligence. And the ability to delay gratification is one of the key indicators of emotional intelligence. Interestingly, it is also an indicator of future success. The Marshmallow Experiment A group of scientists created an experiment to test emotional intelligence. They told four-year-old children that they could have one marshmallow now or if they 
could wait while the researchers ran an errand, they could have two. They then placed marshmallows in front of the children and left the room. Some of the children waited for the second marshmallow, while others immediately devoured the one in front of them. The follow-up research was most fascinating. Those children who could delay gratification, quote, generally grew up to be better adjusted, more popular, adventurous, confident, and dependable. Those who couldn't were more likely to be lonely, easily frustrated, and stubborn. They buckled under stress and shield away from challenges, end quote. In addition, those who can delay gratification also scored an average of 210 points higher on the SATs. My father's epiphany. I'll never forget the night my father called us together for a special family meeting. It was after we had lost our home, and all of us children had gathered in the living room of our little duplex. The mood in our home that night was as somber as a funeral, and my father looked distraught. He didn't know why he had brought us together, but from his countenance, we knew it couldn't be good. He looked us over sadly, then said, I've spent the last three days figuring out why, after all these years of hard work, I have nothing to show for it but bills. Do you know where it all goes? To us, one of us asked. No, he said grimly. I wish. It goes to interest. All those heartbeats went to paying interest to make someone else wealthy. Delaying gratification. Delay gratification. Never borrow money. End quote. Earlier in the third lesson, I demonstrated the power of compound interest. Never forget that compound interest is just as powerful working against you as it is working for you. What might seem like a small expense now can, in the long run, steal your wealth. Simply put, there are two kinds of people, those who earn interest and those who pay it. That's the fundamental difference between the wealthy and the desperate. The millionaire mentality sees clearly the danger of credit and knows that freedom and power are infinitely better than short-lived pleasure. But I deserve it, dot, dot, dot. An employee of mine desired a new car. It was too expensive for their income, but she was intent on convincing me that it was the right choice for her. My husband is about to get a raise. Why shouldn't we have a nice car? Don't we deserve it? Deserve it? She had just regurgitated the greatest marketing sham ever propagated on the American consumer, the result of years of advertising brainwashing. She deserves what? To find happiness based on something that will decay and lose value within a year, yet will continue to financially enslave her long after her infatuation with the metal is gone. In the words of my teenage daughter, is this a good thing? After several discussions, she reluctantly chose not to buy the car. A year later, we visited, revisited her decision. I'm so glad I didn't buy that car, she said. It doesn't even interest me anymore. And my husband didn't get the raise we had planned on. Had we bought that car, we would have found ourselves deep in debt and struggling just to make payments. The next time you hear someone say, you deserve it, red flags should instantly go up in your mind. Someone is trying to take your wealth. Someone is trying to steal your dreams for themselves. What you really deserve is peace of mind, individual freedom, and personal power. Them versus us. With so much wealth at stake, it's no wonder banks and retail businesses work so hard to extend you interest. And their efforts are paying off. In 1970, only 17% of American households had a bank-issued credit card. By 2001, that number had increased to 73%. Today, Americans owe more than 1 billion credit cards. I met a woman at one of my seminars who had 27 different credit cards. In addition to the practice of companies offering special incentives to entice you to take their charge cards, there are other credit-inducing tactics you might not have considered. A typical sales tactic is the no-pain add-on purchase. You've likely been victimized by it. As a teenager, I worked at a fast food restaurant. Whenever we took an order, we were required to ask customers if they wanted fries or a drink to go with their order. Initially, my thought was if they wanted fries or a drink, they would have asked for it. Not so. 
More than half the people I asked changed their order. This technique works on large purchases as well, from cars to houses. Unfortunately, outside the fast food world, there is interest involved. Would you like a refrigerator to go with that house? You've just come to the end of a long and tedious process of qualifying for a home loan. Before the last signature is inked, you are asked, Do you need any appliances? We could easily add a few luxuries onto that loan. How about a refrigerator? What most home buyers don't consider is that this additional purchase goes right on the end of their 30-year mortgage, even at a low interest rate like 5%. After five years, the average cost for a $1,000 refrigerator is nearly double the sales price. And Americans wonder where their money goes. What kind of fool? The poor and the uneducated are particularly susceptible to interest schemes. That's one of the reasons they stay poor. Back when I worked at an advertising agency, we had a client who rented out electronic appliances. You've likely seen similar television commercials. Come to Shem Shams Rent to Own, where you can have it today. As I was listening, listing the weekly price of a VCR for a television commercial, something didn't look right. I called the store manager. This price couldn't be right, I said. It says nineteen ninety nine a week for this VCR. No, that's right. Twenty dollars a week? For how long? A year. You're kidding me. That adds up to more than a thousand dollars for this VCR. It couldn't have cost more than a hundred dollars. Actually, we got it for only sixty. What kind of fool would pay more than a thousand dollars for a sixty dollar VCR? I asked. People who want it now. Successful nest eggers are emotionally intelligent. They can wait, even when it's not the easiest course of action. Because of my own belief in the five lessons, my wife and I decided before we were married that we would never go in debt. We found the engagement ring and the diamond we wanted, but I didn't have enough money to pay for it. Believe me, I was sorely tempted to break my rule and go into debt. I had other pressures besides the jeweler. To start a beautiful fiancé whom I wanted to impress, not to mention the future father-in-law who was certain that I was going to keep his daughter barefoot and pregnant. But with my fiancé's support, we held fast to the rule. We put down what money we had to hold the diamond, then had a cubic zirconium set into the ring until we could pay cash with a real stone. No one knew the difference except us. A few months later, I paid off the diamond and we swapped the stones. For the successful nest egg of freedom and power are infinitely better than momentary satisfaction. Mindset 3. The millionaire mentality does not equate spending with happiness. Money is not required to buy one necessity of the soul. Henry David Thoreau. Too many of us have adopted shopping as catharsis. Quote, shopping is therapy, says a television commercial. Money can buy happiness, just don't pay retail, end quote. Equating spending with happiness is the first step to financial self-destruction. Recently, I met a woman whose daughter was working three jobs trying to keep up with her $50,000 credit card debt. What did she spend all that money on, I asked. Stuff. Clothes and stuff. She had a bad marriage, and she's just trying to fill the void. Unfortunately, all she does now is work, quote-unquote. The successful nest egger fosters gratitude as a strategy against materialism and unhappiness. One of the great antidotes for consumption as therapy is found in the character trait of gratitude. And the millionaire mentality knows this. We live in a world of abundance. The things that bring the greatest joy are not reserved for the wealthy alone. The simplest of pleasures can bring the greatest happiness. What price can we put on inner peace, or health, or friendship, or love? Those who forget to be grateful for what they have often waste their lives and wealth looking for more. Their thirst becomes unquenchable as they seek to buy what cannot be bought. It doesn't matter if these people have one dollar or a billion, because they will never have contentment or happiness. They may be in a high tax bracket, but they will never be truly wealthy. Mindset 4. 
the millionaire mentality protects the nest egg. There was a time when a fool and his money were soon parted, but now it happens to everybody. Adelaide E. Stevenson Successful nest eggers do not risk what they cannot afford to lose. This applies to both investing and living. High risk, get rich quick schemes, and other forms of gambling do not appeal to them. Additionally, successful wealth builders purchase proper insurance to protect their growing wealth. A study conducted by a Harvard University Law School professor found that medical bills and other financial effects of illness or injury contributed to nearly half of the more than one million personal bankruptcy filings in the United States. Having proper insurance can make the difference between financial peace of mind and catastrophe. Is the person I'm trusting with my wealth sufficiently skilled to handle my money? In The Richest Man in Babylon, George S. Clayson tells the story of a man who entrusts his hard-earned money to his friend, a bricklayer, to purchase precious gems. Of course, the bricklayer knows nothing about precious gems, and he returns with worthless pieces of glass. Trust bricklayers with advice about bricks, says his mentor. But especially careful, be especially careful with your money when it comes to family. This is what I call the brother-in-law syndrome. As your wealth grows, you will be set upon by others, usually in-laws it seems, to fund their schemes and business ventures. They will often use emotional manipulation to get you to part with your money. Be kind and simply say, let's take your plan to an expert in the field. In most cases, this will end the inquiry. It's not easy to say no to a loved one, but seeing them lose your money is worse, much worse, and in the end, no one is happy. Whether you win in the margins through creating extra income or through savings, both will get you to where you want to be, but serious wealth accumulators employ both to help them reach their goals. Lesson 5. Give back. All you have shall someday be given. Therefore, give now, that the season of giving may be yours and not your inheritors. Khalil Gibran The great philanthropist Andrew Carnegie said, quote, The problem of our age is the proper administration of wealth. To Carnegie, there were only three possible means by which a man of great wealth could dispose of his fortune. One, he could leave it to his family. Two, he could bequeath it to his will, in his will, for public purposes. Three, he could share it during his lifetime for the public benefit. Of the first, he said, The thoughtful man must shortly say, I would as soon leave my son a curse as the almighty dollar. History is replete with cautionary tales bearing out his words. Carnegie found the second option equally object objectionable. as heirs would likely contest his substantial will, thereby leaving a legacy of greed, contention, and bitterness in the wake of the benefactor's death. Only the third option, the sharing of money in his lifetime, could he accept. Said Carnegie, this then is held to be the duty of the man of wealth, to set an example of modest, unostentatious living, shunning display of extravagance to provide moderately for the legitimate wants of those dependent upon him, and after doing so, to consider all surplus revenues which come to him simply as trust funds which he is called upon to administer. Hmm. Friend or foe. Ultimately, the most honorable and enjoyable use of money is in serving others. Freely giving of our wealth is also the only way to fully protect ourselves from our wealth. Yes, money is a powerful ally, but it can also be a spiritual and emotional enemy. If money becomes what you live for, you will eventually conclude that life is not worth living. While money is an inescapable part of life, it's not life. Hoarding wealth will make your life small and cold. Giving will warm and expand it. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, when you cease to give, you begin to die. Life's Balance Sheet A few years back, I took my oldest daughter, Jenna, on a daddy-daughter date to the Amazon jungle of Peru on a humanitarian mission. I wanted her to not only realize how much we have to be grateful for, but to learn to serve others who are less fortunate. Our journey turned into an extraordinary adventure. We hiked deep into the jungle with machetes, and at one point we ran out of food. The only meat we had was piranha. 
It tastes like chicken. We set up a clinic in the small jungle town of Porto Mald Maldonada, and the Quechuan natives came from miles around. Almost two weeks later, at the end of our excursion, Jenna and I were in the Lima, Peru airport when I asked her what she had learned from the experience. Let me think about it, she said. Twelve hours later, we were in Chicago's O'Hare International Airport waiting for our connection, and I noticed that Jenna was crying. When I asked her what was wrong, she replied, Dad, we have so much, and they have so little. She looked down for a moment, then added, I know what I've learned. We love those whom we serve. Success in life cannot be measured on a balance sheet. I believe that the truest measure of achievement is the degree to which we've learned to love and service through sharing our wealth and our time is love made visible. Financial Karma While generosity feeds the soul, ironically it also feeds the pocketbook. I believe that we receive as we give. It is written in the Bible. Malachi 2, 8-10 through 10, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Offerings, prove me now herewith, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. While I don't believe that this promise written in the Bible applies sol solely, solely to financial blessings, I believe there are karmic principles attached to wealth. We get back when we give. As such, it's important to give not just after we've achieved wealth, but as part of the process. I have tithed 10% of my income since I was 8 years old, and in spite of the hardships of my family was sometimes faced, I have never felt the loss of this money. Rather, I have felt specifically blessed for my contributions. On one occasion, when my business was doing poorly, I called my accountant and asked him to review my financial records over the last year to see if I had, in fact, paid a true tithe of 10%. He called back the next day and told me that I was $800 short. I wrote a check immediately and sent it off. The next day, I had three calls from former clients needing work done immediately. Coincidence? Maybe, but I don't think so. I've heard similar stories from friends and associates of different faiths around the world. The sin of the desert is knowing where the water is and not telling anyone. In addition to sharing your wealth, you have a responsibility to share the lesson of proper money management with others. Within 24 books, 24 hours of reading this book, teach these five lessons to a spouse, a teenage son or daughter, or a friend. In the next week, share this book with those you care about. As you share these principles, you will see firsthand the gift of giving back. Teaching the five lessons to others will help you internalize them and become better prepared to live and enjoy the fruits of them yourself. Conclusion Is it ever too late to start? A few months ago, a reporter was in my office interviewing me about one of my charities when he noticed the cover of The Five Lessons on my desk. He asked me what the book was about. I briefly explained the five principles of wealth, then invited him to attend one of my seminars. I could use that, he said, but I'm afraid it's too late. To my surprise, his eyes watered. My daughter called this morning. She needs money for college. I had to tell her that I can't help her. I just don't have it. Is it ever too late to live these principles? My answer is a resounding no. Yes, it can be too late to take full advantage of the power of compound interest, but progress is progress. It's never too late to do the right thing or the smart thing and enjoy the benefits it brings. Harkening back to my earlier example of Heather and James, even if they never reach their goal of complete financial freedom, although I believe that they will, they are already light years ahead of where they were and are free of their daily, their daily hurt and the bondage of debt. They are already enjoying more of the blessings of living in this free and abundant country. Most importantly, they have hope, and hope is always worth striving for. In the end, we end where we begin. Life is not about money. It's about God. It's about love. It's about family and relationships. In sharing with you these principles, it is my hope that you will always give back, that you might find life's true abundance. All millionaires die, but there are no dead millionaires. 
their wealth passes on. As Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, was fond of saying, I've never seen a Brinks truck, a Brinks truck following a hearse. If you have lived successfully, your estate will consist of more than material possessions, and your legacy will be more than cash, stocks, and IRAs. Remember this, that you must, that you may use your wealth wisely, find true abundance, and live, as Mark Twain said, so that even the undertaker mourns your passing. In the end, this is true wealth. The Five Lessons Resources Winning in the Margins with Extra Income Remember, winning in the margins with extra income will come through paying attention to the unique opportunities that already surround you. Jobs to increase your income Wait tables on the weekends Turn your hobbies into jobs Learn to make jewelry and sell it at local fairs. Teach cooking classes. Referee. Teach piano lessons. Babysit. House sit. Clean houses or office buildings. Refurbish furniture and sell it to consignment stores. Pick up a paper route. Repair cars. Put up and take down other people's Christmas lights. Do freelance work. Start a lawn care business. Donate plasma. Help coach a local sporting team. Become a massage therapist. Teach private swim lessons. Sell homemade rolls or treats around the holidays. Sell gift baskets. Get certified and teach aerobics or water aerobics. If you are a good photographer, start a small business. Breed animals. Teach language lessons. Look into credible multi-level marketing opportunities. How to select a legitimate network marketing company. Before starting any business, ask yourself these questions. 1. Do you really like the product or service that is reasonably priced? Number 1. Do you really like the product or service and is it reasonably priced? 2. If it's health-related product, are the product's claims substantiated by the FDA? 3. Is it expensive to join? A startup fee of more than $100 is an indication of a possible scam. 4. Can you comfortably afford the monthly product costs, and would you use the product even if you didn't hope to profit from it? 5. Are you willing to maximize the tax advantage of a home business? 6. Are you willing to work hard, and are there people willing to support you? If you can answer yes to all six questions, network marketing might be a means for you to win in the margins. Before joining, read everything you can about a company, including reports from the FTC. For a free online report on how you can increase your earning ability, visit my website at www.marginswin.com. That's M-A-R-G-I-N-S-W-I-N.com. And enter WIN when asked for your passkey. Winning in the margins with savings. When winning in the margins with savings, always remember to apply the four mindsets. One, the millionaire mentality carefully considers each expenditure. Two, the millionaire mentality believes that freedom and power are better than momentary pleasure. Three, the millionaire mentality does not equate spending with happiness. And four, the millionaire mentality protects the nest egg. As you fill out your monthly cash flow form, review each expenditure, then begin looking for ways to save. Remember that the Internet has put more power in consumers' hands than ever before. Be sure to take full advantage of it. In each applicable category, we have included a list of websites to help you save. Don't expect all of the suggestions to be right for you. Check off the ones that you find helpful. Remember, the goal is to reduce your expenditures by ad an additional 10% of your income so as to double your contribution to your nest egg. Building the nest egg. Put a minimum of 10% of your monthly salary and 90 to 100% of your extra income into your nest egg. If you receive a pay increase, put the extra away in savings. Take advantage of banks and brokerage firms' automatic withdrawal plans that will take money from your checking account and put it into your savings account. When you have finished paying off your debt, divert the money you were using to pay it off into your nest egg. 
Collect all your spare change in a jar. When it is full, deposit it into your nest egg. It will add up to more than you think. In our research, a cup of miscellaneous coins is worth about $24. Mortgage and rent. You can save thousands of dollars in interest charges by shopping for the lowest rate. Always obtain more than one quote before accepting a loan. Be sure to ask about all fees involved. Use an adjustable rate mortgage, an arm, only if you can't afford a fixed rate loan or if you intend to sell the home within a few years. Choose the shortest term loan you can afford. Be cautious in taking out home equity loans. The loans reduce or may even eliminate the equity that you have built up in your home. Equity is the cash you would have if you sold your house and paid off your mortgage loans. By making just one extra mortgage payment every year, you can reduce the time span of the loan by up to seven years. Plan right now to double your payments one month this year, or split the amount of 13 payments into 12 even payments. Check the tax account. Check the tax assessment of your property. If you think you are paying taxes based on too high an evaluation, contact the assessor's office and file an appeal. According to the Association of Assessing Offices, over half of all appeals result in the reduction of taxes. Look into refinancing your mortgage anytime rates fall. Falls a half percentage point below your existing rate. Drop private mortgage insurance, PMI, if it is no longer necessary. While this insurance is sometimes required when you first purchase a home, in most cases, it can be dropped after you have paid off 20% of the loan. Ask your lender about termination rules. It may have been done automatically, but if you, but if not, you could save an extra $25 a month. Rent out a room or basement. Find a roommate. Rent from a private party rather than a corporation when possible. You may avoid automatic periodic increases in rent. Spend no more than 20% of your monthly gross income on your rent. The extra money you allocate for rent in a slightly more upscale complex means less money for your other expenses, utilities, loan payments, entertainment, food, and most important, savings. Food. Shop with a list. Plan your shopping based on sales and specials and avoid impulse purchasing. Comparison shop by looking at the unit price listed on the shelf below each item. The unit price indicates the cost per pound or ounce. Join a wholesale superstore such as Costco or Sam's Club. Buy necessities such as some food staples and toiletries in bulk. Eat out more frugally and avoid beverages. Many restaurants make a large profit on beverages, especially alcohol. Few people check the price of drinks, and restaurant tourists know this. On one occasion, I found that a simple soda costs nearly as much as some of a particular restaurant's entrees. Ordering vegetarian meals saves money, as they generally cost less than meal-based entrees, meat-based entrees. Try brown bagging it twice a week instead of eating out. Some consumer groups estimate that this will save you at least $500 per year, not to mention the calories. Do your grocery shopping on double coupon days. Purchase generic brands. According to some experts, this can save you an average of 40% off your annual grocery bill. Watch for discounts on non-perishables that you buy regularly and stock up when they are on sale. Shop for meat early or late in the day when certain cuts may be at a discount. Prepackaged goods cost more. Cook from scratch more often. Always keep the ingredients for at least one quick and easy meal in the house to avoid unplanned eating out when tired or in a hurry. Always check receipts for accuracy, especially with coupons and produce. Check prices on grocery store sales. Actual savings may be insignificant or misleading. Buy loss leaders. These are the items on the front page of the ad and are often sold at cost just to get you into the store. Fresh food areas usually have a section featuring items that will expire within a few days. These items can be discounted anywhere from 50 to 70 percent. Avoid purchasing non-grocery products such as cosmetics and household items in grocery stores. These products are usually marked up 25 percent higher than they are in discount drug stores. Grow your own garden. Search the internet for freebies and coupons. 
from manufacturers. See list at the end of this section. Have a potluck or barbecue dinner with friends instead of going out to dinner. You've heard it before, never shop hungry. Researchers have shown that on the average, consumers spend 10% more when they go to the grocery store hungry. Carry a calculator with you whenever you shop. Do your grocery shopping on Monday. Prices on average are lower. The best all-purpose cleaner is chlorine bleach. You can clean toilets, sinks, floors, and walls and potentially save $20 a month. Food savings websites. Coupons.com, Q-Pond.com, HotCoupons.com, CoolSavings.com, CouponCart.com, CouponOrganizer.com, FrugalShopper.com, Volpack.com. Utilities. Check windows and doors for air leaks. Use caulk to seal them. A package of caulk will cost less than $5. Check your local home improvement stores for more ideas. Insulate your water heater. Although your water heater and pipes may be insulated on the inside, they can lose heat and energy through the outside casing. Insulating blankets are available at most home improvement stores. They are easy to install and can save you up to 3% on monthly heating bills. Turn down your heat by 5 degrees and wear a sweater. This could save 15% on your heating bills. During the summer months, use the air conditioner as little as possible. You will see dramatic savings in your, electron, in your electric bill. Contact your energy supplier. Your local electric and gas companies may have various reduced rate plans depending on your age, income level, or dwelling. Replace 100-watt bulbs with 60-watt bulbs. Sometimes the best way to save money takes money. Replacing old appliances with newer and more energy-efficient ones may save you money in the long run. Install a water flow regulator in shower heads and toilet bowls. This can reduce the amount of water use by 50% without a noticeable difference in pressure. Buy energy-saving light bulbs. Unplug appliances. Fix leaky faucets. Leaky faucets can weigh 6 to 10 gallons of water per day. Install dimmers in living areas such as dining rooms and bedrooms. Lights dimmed 15% reduce energy consumption by 15%. Use electric timers to conserve energy. These can be purchased at any home improvement store. Use a programmable thermostat to lower the heat at night after you're asleep. Also lower your heat when you're not at home. Pay for a year's worth of cable or satellite television or internet. This may help you avoid extra monthly charges. Use high energy appliances such as dishwashers and wash washing machines on off peak hours. Call your utility company to find out about different rates for on and off peak times. Close heat vents in any room that does not need to be heated. Attics should be insulated to avoid heat or air conditioning from escape. Escaping. Double pane your windows. As mentioned earlier, renting to, to own is likely the most expensive way to purchasing something, such as a VCR. If you can't wait, find another way to finance the item you want to buy. Be aware of your phone usage. Calls made after 5 p.m. are cheaper in most places than calls placed between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Shop around for a calling plan that best fits your needs. Turn off lights, television, and other appliances when leaving a room. Learn to fix minor things around the house to avoid having to pay a plumber or handyman. Check your utility bill. One study showed that four out of five companies overcharged on their utilities. Utilities auditing companies report that on the average, most homeowners are overcharged by 20%. Transportation, car payments, and expenses. When buying a new car, check out new car guides to help you with the model information and pricing. Don't buy more car or cars than you need. Most of my millionaire friends drive economy cars. Before you buy a used car, compare the seller's asking price with the average retail price in a blue book. Try kellybluebook.com. K-E-L-L-Y-B-L-U-E-B-O-O-K dot com. Have a mechanic you trust inspect the car before you agree to purchase. Always think long term when buying a car. 
you pay much more than the initial cost of the car, including gas, insurance, registration fees, maintenance, and repairs. Buy regular unleaded gas. Many studies have shown that more expensive fuel isn't worth it. Check your dealer or mechanic. Fill up on gas when shopping at a warehouse wholesaler where gas is cheaper. Carpooling with co-workers twice a week could save you up to $20 a month. Buy commuter passes where available. Don't use credit cards to buy gas if it requires paying a higher price. Service cars regularly before problems develop. Change the oil in your car, yourself, every 3,000 miles. Keep wheels aligned and balanced. If a mechanic finds a problem during routine maintenance, get a second opinion and another estimate before making repairs. Don't buy tires that are said to last thousands of miles longer than you intend to drive your car. It is a lot more expensive and unnecessary. By paying cash, you can save a nickel per gallon at many gas pumps. Use air conditioning in your car only when needed. The extra load on the engine severely reduces mileage. Avoid poor driving habits. Maintain, maintaining a constant speed over a long distance saves gas. Excess braking wastes fuel up to 20%. An interesting website to check local gas prices is gasbuddy.com. G-A-S... B U D D Y dot com. A friend of mine figured out a way to drive cars for free. In fact, he actually made money on them. Every six months or so, he'd go to local car auctions and buy a car. He'd drive the car for six months, then turn around and sell it at a profit. He'd then go back to the auction and start the process all over again. Air travel. Fly on Sundays rather than Saturdays. Book flights early. Most flights increase in cost when you book less than two weeks in advance. Be flexible when booking flights. Buy tickets during the week. Oftentimes, fares are raised temporarily for the weekend. Ask about discounts for seniors and children. Be sure to check on discount carriers. Websites for hotel, travel, and airfare discounts. Expedia.com, Hotels.com, CheapFares.com, 11thHourVacation.com, Hotwire.com, HaveKids-WillTravel.com. This site offers a fascinating guide to family travel anywhere in the world at remarkably reduced rates, oftentimes free. Automobile insurance. Always shop around to get the best possible insurance rates. A study by Progressive Insurance shows that the cost of an auto insurance policy for the same driver with the same or comparable coverage can vary from company to company by as much as $1,000 a year. Raise your deductible. According to the Insurance Information Institute, Institute, raising your deductible from $200 to $500 could reduce your collision and comprehensible cost 15 to 30%. Make sure your current policy accurately reflects your needs. It is important to update your information on your driving record, age, and the model of car you drive. The correct information can reduce your rate. You may receive added discounts by holding a policy with one company for a long period of time. Medical insurance. As explained in Lesson 4, always have at least minimal medical coverage to protect yourself and your nest egg against catastrophe. Always get second opinions before making major medical decisions. If you spend time in a hospital, carefully check the itemized bill to be sure that there were no incorrect charges. One consumer advocacy group reports that 90% of hospital bills contain errors with overcharges accounting for approximately two-thirds of those errors. Buy generic drugs and no frills vitamins. You can save up to 50% on some drugs. Always check with your doctor before taking generic drugs, though. Shop around for prescriptions on the internet or use a mail order company. The average savings are 30%. Homeowner's insurance. Make your home more resistant to disaster. 
Find out how through your insurance agent or a company representative. When deciding how much insurance to buy, don't include the value of the land under your home as it isn't at risk for theft or fire. Install smoke detectors, deadbolt locks, or burglar alarms to cut your premiums. Ask your insurance agent if you qualify for any discounts. Review the value of your possessions yearly to be sure you're paying only for coverage you need. These should already be done. Be on your net worth form. If you are paying homeowners insurance through the government, look into private insurance as it may be cheaper. Debt payments. Use credit cards that don't charge an annual fee, such as Discover, GM, Ford, AFBA, Industrial Bank, or USAA Federal Savings. Refinance your mortgage for a lower interest rate and use that money to pay off existing debt. Keep the two credit cards with the lowest interest rates. When paying monthly credit card bills, pay the full amount or calculate how much you can afford to pay over the minimum. When applicable, see Lesson 3, use some of your savings to get out of debt. Seek help through a nonprofit consumer credit counseling service or seek out a financial support group. Resolve that you will use your credit cards only for essentials over the next six months. Clothing. Shop clearance sales. When stores begin to put out next season's clothes, you can save 30 to 75 percent on your family's clothing budget. Avoid clothes that must be dry cleaned. Buy machine washable clothes rather than silks or wools. Hand wash and iron your shirts instead of dry cleaning them. Shop at thrift stores or upscale clothing consignment stores. Shop for children's school clothes after school starts to avoid the rush and peak prices. Minimize accessories that won't be used frequently. Stick with classic styles and don't always change your wardrobe to suit current fashion trends. Shop for only a few hours at a time. You'll be less likely to buy impulsively. Clothing and Home Accessories Websites Bluefly.com Overstock.com JumpOnDeals.com JustDeals.com GoGoShoppers.com SmartBargains.com